ஒன்னொரு <laughs> <laughs> uh this uh, which is uh, mainly uh, conducted for the benefit of all the practicing pediatricians of uh, uh, of our uh, state uh, and our ch- chapter uh they, they, uh they today we are going to talk about uh, the common uh, skin conditions both common and of course some rare conditions so before wasting much time let me call upon dr rajkumar uh, to say the pediatrician's prayer please thank you sir pediatrician's prayer grant us the quality of holistic healing may we humbly realize how privileged we are in being bestowed with the ability to alleviate suffering may we be emissaries of health learning charity love and peace to all children and their families irrespective of status and creed give us the wisdom understanding to change the things we can retain the good and accept within reason the things we cannot change grant us your blessings grace and mercy in all situations at all times and amid all people thank you thank you uh, thank you very much uh, uh, dr uh, rajkumar editor of iapt nsc um the whole idea of the series uh, is to have a more interactive useful session previously we were having monthly cmas uh, where some people felt that there was a overload of inf- uh, information so our president dr suresh palan uh came up with this idea of uh, changing these programs to a more interactive program mainly for targeting primary care pediatricians so the the brain behind this program is our aps coordinator dr uh, k rajendran and uh, the coordinator of the program is dr ashwath so i thank both of them for taking lot of effort in trying to organize this program uh, my special thanks to the uh, sp- uh to the moderators for the the uh, for today's session uh, dr madhu ma'am and uh, dr kartik ayan uh, without wasting much time i uh, hand over the stage to dr uh, uh, rajendran for for the proceedings please uh, thank you our dynamic secretary dr thirumurugan and uh, respected our president dr suresh balan and president um, uh, past uh, dr ramesh babu and president elect dr balashankar and uh, our uh, under secretary dr thirumurugan and treasurer dr dashani and uh, on behalf of uh, apt nsc i am thankful to them and uh, so i really welcome today's expert uh, uh, that uh, moderators dr kartikeyan uh, kaliya perumal and dr madhu madam they both are uh, well known um, dermatologists pediatric dermatologists they are um, state wise even national wise they are having a lot of um, um, uh, conference as well as uh, seminars and uh, there are a lot of topics in the uh, test book also. Uh, I welcome both the Dr. Karthigayan and Dr. Madhu. And uh, I welcome on behalf of IAPTNC, I welcome today's um, uh, program convener, Dr. Uh, Aswath, uh, Dr. Sri Devi, Dr. Balaji and as well as Dr. Palani Raman, Dr. S. Raju from uh, Thirnar Valley. And I welcome all the uh, presenters from uh, various uh, part of our uh, Tamil Nadu. I uh, from the gap of IAPT in uh, Kerala and I really it's a fourth uh, uh, post series and it definitely it be useful for our um, uh, practicing pediatrician that same we are having and we are having some innovative ideas like um, what are the common problems we are going to face uh, we are having and um, current um, even any issues based upon that only we are selecting the topic and uh, we need input also from our various um, iap members and as well as um, 
uh, teaching institutions as well as uh, non teaching institution also so definitely we will uh, take it and we will uh, make a topic according to their um, vision as well as um, current scenario also and uh, once again thank uh, one and all for this uh, uh, making this program one of the successful program also and i really uh, uh, thankful to our iap tnc and as well as the central as well as uh, state tp members to make this possible and now i uh, welcome our uh, convener dr aswath uh, dr parisami to make this uh, proceeding call oh, thanks dr kedaji good evening one and all it's a great pleasure to be here in this evening to look at some pediatric dermatology issues. Skin is the largest organ, yet in most predicons, most places, uh, the skin is not given the due recognition that it deserves. So our idea here in this Posty series is to have a healthy mix of common case scenarios and also to sensitize the practicing pediatrician to recognize the not so rare manifestation even if they are not able to manage it at higher level, they should be able to recognize and refer to the appropriate authority. So that is the primary aim of the Kursky series. We are thankful to our uh, judges and moderators today, Dr. Madhu Ma'am and Dr. Kathika Insta. Without further ado, may I request the first presenter, Dr. Anjana, to start her presentation. Yes. Uh, good evening, everyone. You can screen share, Dr. Anjana. Yes, sir. Yes. Perfect. Yes. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity. I would like to present the child with fever with rash. Uh, 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 Anjali, can you go for full screen? No? Yes. Sir. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah, please yes. proceed. I would like to present the child who was a two year old boy who presented with the chief complaints of rash for three days and fever for three days. Uh, this child was apparently asymptomatic three days prior when the mother noticed uh, sudden onset skin rashes, which was initially noted in the forehead and the underarms uh, and the groin, and then eventually uh, progressed to involve the tongue. She also noticed that the rashes were eventually red and then turned out to be fluid filled and became large. And she noticed that there was data peeling of skin by the third day. The, uh, the mother also mentions the presence of high grade fever since the last three days. Uh, the, the fever settled with antipyretics, however, recurred every six hours, and the child continued to be dull in the interfebrile period. Uh, the child's intake has been poor for the last three days, but has worsened in the last six, uh, six to eight hours, and his urine output has also been suboptimal. The child has been irritable for the last three days, and his complaints of pain when the mother touches him uh, anywhere near the rashes, and his irritability has also increased since the uh, day of presentation, and this is concerning the mother. There are no other history of uh, cough or cold or diarrhea or any other systemic illnesses. The past history is insignificant and there's no history of any drug uh, intake in the last three to four weeks. And there's no prior history of drug allergies in the child. Uh, moving to the clinical features, the first picture is what the mother showed uh, of the day prior to the presentation. The picture to the right is when we, the child presented to the ER. He was irritable, uh, febrile with a temperature of 101 degree Fahrenheit. He was tachycardic, heart rate was 130, and BP was 98 by 64 mercury millimeters. Uh, respiratory, he was not, his respiratory rate was 28 per minute, and he was maintaining saturation on room air. The local examination revealed a flask, fragile bully on his forehead, uh, typic, uh, an, ex, an exfoliative lesions on the left shoulder, and he had a perioral thrusting that was noted, along with minimal fissuring. However, there was no involvement inside the oral cavity. Uh, similar lesions were also present in the axilla and the right leg and on uh, applying tangential pressure, Nikolsky's sign was positive. Mm -hmm. He also had erythema on the back and the chest and the skin was tender on palpation. There was zero sanguinous discharge from some of the lesions. His genitalia, palms and soles were normal. Uh, the investigations revealed a uh, uh, iron deficiency. Dr. Anjana, can we take a break here and go back to the previous picture? Yes. And the previous picture? Yes. Um, may we have the moderator's opinion on uh, general approach to a child with a febrile illness and vesicular bullet reduction? Madhu, ma'am, how would you expect us to work up these patients or what are the differentials that you would want us to consider in this scenario, ma'am? audible? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Angela, for this presentation. As far as this particular uh, child goes, she's given history of uh, Placid bullying initially, and which are rupturing within two to three days. 
and she very well mentioned about how the child is irritable and the skin is tender to touch and Nikolsky is positive and you have to mention about mucosal lesions also and the general predilection for periorofacial lesions normally some uh, 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 i mean there's a copy of infection following which the child develops a vesiculobullous rash which are very superficial blisters initially and subsequently the second or the third day it ruptures to leave some denuded areas with a periorofacial or uh, the I mean, the flexural uh, uh, predisposition so these will give you a clue along with the irritability of the child tender skin to touch absence of mucosal involvement this is for the classical staphylococcus calvus kid syndrome in the case of your other vesicular bullous condition that you have to think of course varicella is pretty well known to all of you and uh, how do you differentiate this between from toxic epidermal necrolysis which is a cutaneous adverse event reaction which involves more than 30% of body surface area in the case of toxic epidermal necrolysis also you can have a child with tender skin but then there will be mucosal involvement and there will be a typical history of some drug which has been given for some illness so extensive areas of involvement along with mucosa involvement that will be a clue for toxic epidermal necrolysis wherein systemic corticosteroids becomes the drug of choice for treatment for 10 Whereas in Staphylococcus cataracts syndrome, which is due to the, we know that it is due to toxin A, and here there is, you should not give corticosteroid, and the mainstay is going to be the care of the skin along with systemic antibiotics, probably epinomycin. And what is important is to admit a child, take care of the electrolytes, you have to take care of the fluids, because sometimes when you have extensive denuded area, that will be a skin failure. So IV fluid is important, IV antibiotics. And subsequently, once the child stabilizes, you can always go in for antibiotic solution. And when there is exudation and losing crusting, normal, we advise normal saline compresses. Saline compresses, which should be normally, you can ask the mother to uh, fold the gloss in four, you know, into four folds, dip it in normal saline and put it over the exudative lesions, leave it there for 15 minutes, and subsequently it can be taken away. So this will help you in reducing the oozing and crusting. Thank you so much, ma'am. Dr. Kathike, and can you please uh, tell us how to elicit the Nikolsky sign and please also tell us whether it is specific for uh, staphylococcal calvary skin syndrome or there are other differentials that one needs to consider? Uh, uh, good evening for everyone. I think I'm audible. Uh, there is something very interesting. Actually, uh, Nikolsky sign is a sign which is elicited ideally on a normal appearing skin or a skin which is not denuded. So it is defined as a firm tangential pressure which you apply on the skin. So you can use your thumb over the skin and just give a tangential pressure. This tangential pressure results in denudation of the skin. The skin denudes, the diagnosis is very clear. We call it a uh, positive Nikolsky sign. This positive Nikolsky sign has two features, particularly in case of uh, staphylococcal scarlet skin syndrome, we call it a dry Nikolsky. So when you do a Nikolsky sign, the skin under is not oozy. It's very dry. As we have already know, uh, in case of uh, staphylococcal scarlet skin syndrome, the skin is per se very dry. So you won't have oozing from the lesion, but the Nikolsky is positive. As already mentioned by Dr. Madhu, there is something called skin tenderness, which is very classical of staphylococcal scarlet skin syndrome. So when you touch the skin itself, the child starts screaming. The tendon is very classical and a positive Nikolsky. Though Nikolsky sign is seen in so many other conditions, it can be one is uh, classically staphylococcal scarlet syndrome, other one is TEN. But there the skin necrosis is there. If you see the skin itself here, it's a dry parched skin and there it is a necrosed erythematous skin. So when you peel it, you find the necrosis of the skin. The skin just peels off with necrosis. That's a classical differentiation point. There is another condition we can get, particularly in uh, pemphigus in uh, infantile or in childhood pemphigus, where you find the Nikolsky positive. But the differentiation point is the oral lesions. Pemphigus children is very rare in children. And if they have, they always have oral lesions. So that is a probable fact you should think of. Another one important condition I wanted to stress as differential diagnosis, which many a times is missed is, when people have herpetic gingivostomatitis, stomatitis, you have kids with herpetic gingivostomatitis, stomatitis, they have severe oral ulcerations, they also are febrile, and they develop a vesicular rash that is called erythema, EMF, erythema multiforme, which can be vesicular. 
and many people mistake it for a chicken pox or a staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome because people have children have vesicular lesions on the body which is we call it as erythema multiforme which can occur with herpetic gingivostomatitis so dikowski sign is very classical and if you can elicit it is diagnostic and you can treat the child appropriately so i think the value of nikolsky sign cannot be uh, underestimated and clinical signs can be very very useful in diagnosis of patients because you have to start treatment on the patients thank you thank you sir anjana dr anjana you can proceed yes sir you can go to the investigation <coughs> uh, the investigations done revealed um, cbc showed uh, iron features of iron deficiency anemia there was no features of sepsis Uh, crp was mildly elevated at, at uh, 10 mg per dl liver enzymes and electrolytes done were normal the blood cultures were sterile however the swab taken from the pus culture revealed methicillin sensitive staphylococcal aureus at uh, 30 hours of admission uh, the differential diagnosis that was uh, considered was staphylococcal yes. yes sir yes you can go uh, so, yes sir After having established the clinical diagnosis of Staphylococcal scordelsen syndrome, the child was admitted in the high dependency unit for close monitoring. Strict barrier nursing was uh, ensured. The child was started on IV fluids and adequate hy- hydration was maintained. Uh, the child was initially started on IV vancomycin, uh, awaiting the culture sensitivity reports. And uh, pediatric dermatologist's opinion was also sought. And the child was started on mupirocin to uh, mupirocin topical uh, application for rashes in the face and other perior in the perioral region. and uh, as uh, mentioned the sterile saline soap gauze was applied on the crusted lesions three times a day for 15 minutes each and uh, bland moisturizer emollient was applied over the exfoliated lesions at uh, around 6 to 8 hours of uh, uh, hvo stay the child continued to have a, a, a tachycardia and has also had narrow pulse pressure and hence a decision to administer iv ig 2 g per kg was decided Uh, after the culture sensitivity reports arrived at uh, for 40 hours of stay at the based on mssa report the antibiotics was deescalated to iv cefazolin and uh, at day by day 3 of admission there was spacing of the fever was noted and the child had no new lesions and then was shifted to the ward after shifting to the ward the child had no further lesion there was crusting of all lesions that was noted and by day 9 of hospital stay and having completed 9 days of iv antibiotics he was discharged on 5 days of oral cefalexin and uh, the parents were advised to do, do a uh, testing of their nasal swab for the carrier status and uh, they were also strictly uh, uh, counseled to avoid multiple handling of the child regular disinfection using chlorhexidin and also to ensure that the child's fingernails should be cut to avoid staphylococcal contamination thank you dr Anjana, for that very lucid and uh, brief presentation, ma'am. Before we wrap up, there are two questions we have for you, Doctor Madhu. Madhu, ma'am. Yes, sir. yes, I'm there. Yeah. Ma'am, there are uh, two points. Um, how often, because it's staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome, as we understand, is a toxin mediated disease. How often do we actually grow staphylococcus from the lesions? Is the first point. Second. Uh, is MRSA infection more likely to produce staphylococcus skin syndrome? Do we need to start with simple cloxacillin trendamycin, or should we be very aggressive and start vancomycin as was done in this case? These are the two studies. Now, the first point is basically, as you said, this is exotoxin mediated and not necessarily you should always start. It would be more often sterile. So that is number one point. And sometimes when you have a copy of cutaneous infections, maybe that probably in this case, and that is why she's talked about it, MSSA being you know isolated. and as far as uh, the consideration of parental antibiotic comes when the, the body surface area becomes extensively involved the child is irritable high grade fever now those will be the indications for starting the parental antibiotic when you have a child who is reported to you earlier at the uh, early initial stage of one or two days of fever just a superficial blood area probably you will see a lesion only over the peri orofacial i mean peri oral or maybe peri anal and sometimes just a local lesion in axilla and the child probably has a mild uri and that is the case they can you can even treat with simple uh, oral cefalexin so the, uh, the question becomes the severity and the presentation of the child to look for the systemic symptoms and then you decide on a parenteral antibiotic but even after parenteral antibiotic by the fifth or the seventh day when the child becomes a little uh, okay then you then switch over to the oral antibiotics for another five days as was done in this case at least a minimum of 10 days and she had mentioned about the nasal swab for testing carrier status Now, whenever the child has had recurrent uh, 
uh, you know, impetigo in the past, if at all, when you have a history, it becomes important to uh, treat the carrier status as well. And how do we treat the carrier status? We start asking them to apply the Miprosin cream, basically in the near anterior nares and uh, in the case of axilla and peri umbilical, uh, umbilical and peri anal areas twice daily for a period of at least 10 days. And uh, as far as application of Miprosin for the skin lesions goes, it has to be applied three times daily three times daily for a period of five to seven days. Before we wrap up this came to your comments on the use of IV gamma, ma'am, when would we consider IV gamma in the child with scalded skin syndrome? Yeah, normally in the staphylococcus scalded skin syndrome, IV gamma globulin really does not come to baby. I mean, we tend to recommend IV gamma globulin more in the cases of, you know, toxic epidermal necrolysis. But here probably uh, because the child's condition is tachycardia persistent, and the narrow, uh, you know, pulse pressure, probably they, you know, contemplated giving IV gamma. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for your comments. Thank you, Dr. Anjima. Can we move on to the next case scenario, please? Yeah, next, uh, Dr. Tripura Sundari is there. Dr. Tripura Sundari. Yes, sir. Yeah. Are you ready? Yes, sir. Yeah. Shall we start, sir? Yes, sir. Yeah, please proceed. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Tribhu Sandri, final year postgraduate, Government Milpra Medical College. A 64 day old female child brought to the hospital, mother with a complaint of ulcer in the gluteal area for the past five days. The ulcer was noted by mother, was initially started by practical rash in um, perianal region since birth which then begins to ulcerate completely for the past one week. The mother age was 23, primary, non consignous marriage, antenatal weight gain was adequate, no issue of previous abortion and uh, stillbirth, no issue of uh, drug in, previous drug intake and radiation exposure, anomaly scan was normal. At 39 weeks, the mother had a deliver, delivered a female child by LSAS at the Divinum Degas. The birth weight is 2.3 kg, tried immediately birth, Abgar was normal, no history of NICU admission. The child was the mother noticed a practical rash in the gluteal region since birth. Another pinpoint people, pinpoint red color lesion noted in right hand since birth. Baby taking direct breastfeeding well since birth. The child grew normally with adequate weight gain. The milestones were appropriate for age. On examination, the child generally good condition good. Cryon activity normal, afebrile, perfusion normal, no failure, no uteric, no sinus, no clubbing, and no generalized lymphadenopathy. System examination was normal. And alternative lesion of size, 4 cross into 3 cm, extending from gluteal club to perineal region with the pectical rash around the ulcer. The ulcer is punched out and non healing. Another pinpoint red color lesion noted in the right former surface, present since birth, no other lesions were noted anywhere else in the body. This is the lesion. Investigation wise, complete records normal. Other blood investigation was normal. And the imaging was chest x-ray, echo and USC abdomen and pelvis. And the kidney and urine barrel was normal. And my differential... We can stop here, Dr. Tarpur Sundari. Can you go back to the picture and leave it there now on the screen so that the audience can see that? No, the previous. Thanks. Dr. Kartikeyan, can you please uh, guide us on how to approach and manage children with such ulcerative lesions, sir? multiple ulcerative lesions on the skin? Uh, uh, good evening. The multiple ulcerative uh, lesions in the perianal area. These, is a, uh, these conditions are very uh, tough to diagnose because you need a lot of investigation. But differential diagnosis, first you should consider is, obviously you can think of congenital syphilis. There is one condition because it can present with uh, later lesions, which can be 
what we call papules, which are moist papules, which can occur in the perianal area typically. Uh, but usually it is not very common nowadays to get congenital syphilis because antenatal screening is done strictly in all uh, immunized mothers. So because of that, but still we do get cases. We have seen cases like this, which have in the perianal area. One is that. Next one, it could be a candidiasis uh, with uh, uh, secondary we call jacuzzi ulcers because of steroid abuse. It's very common nowadays we find steroid usage, which occurs in the perianal area. That is one possibility. And another condition is, uh, which are very rare, are Langhan cystiocytosis. That is one condition which you should consider. But usually the ulcers are not multiple. It is uh, solitary ulcers. Uh, and as such, ulcerative lesions in any, uh, if it could be a, uh, perianal dermatitis or any other conditions with secondary irritant uh, ulceration, that is a possibility you should consider. But one more important thing, which is the point is the lesions in the hand and uh, other lesions. So all these conditions probably make us think of other possibilities, whatever I told you. These are the some of the differential diagnoses you should consider about uh, when you have a perianal ulcers, which are multiple in nature. Thank you, sir. Should the inflammatory bowel disease or Crohn's be a consideration too? However, young child, would that present like this, sir? Uh, it can present. It's a nodule. But they are more of, uh, you in Crohn's, you get uh, you get sinus ulcerate with more of sinus, which is there. So you have oh. sinus, discharging sinus and nodules and that type of lesions. These flat ulcerations, which we see typically here, multiple, uh, may even be very rare probably in that condition. There have been repeated questions in the chat box about uh, zinc deficiency as the cause of such implantation. So your comment about that? Zinc deficiency usually, which occurs, we call as acrodermatitis enteropathica, classically occurs only during the weaning period, not very early. So it is ba basically occurs due to the defect in the carrier, zinc carrier transport. So what happens during the weaning period when uh, the child is deficient of this carrier transport, they develop this period, not so early. And in zinc deficiency also, they develop ulcerations widespread in the perianal. Perioral lesions are also very classical in zinc deficiency. Oh. And the child has very peevish, irritable, hair disorders and nail changes. All of them occur in that classical acrodermatitis enteropathica, uh, which is due to zinc deficiency. Thank you. Dr. Sandri, you can proceed now. Dermatologist clinically diagnosed with the infantile hemangioma, and a pediatric surgeon open, uh, opinion suggests for non getting ulcer to get treated with conservative management. Initially, the child had, uh, initially though, started a oral propanolol one milligram per kg in uh, divided three divided doses. After one week, the lesion size has decreased slightly with less discoloration. Propanol dose was increased to 2 mg per kg per day in divided, three divided doses. Uh, child on follow-up therapy every month and, uh, and, a follow and um, oral antibiotics and oral uh, topical antibiotics given. On follow-up, after two weeks, the lesions start to heal. It was decided to wait for response of uh, propanol with a regular follow-up. This was the lesion. Nine week at the came for nine week at eleven weeks started a oral propanol after eleven weeks fourteen weeks and it started heal at twenty weeks. Lovely, thank you, Doctor Tupro Sundari, for that uh, very lucid and very well worked up and very beautifully illustrated case as to how a simple intervention that gives such fantastic results. Madhu, ma'am, can you please educate us on? Which patients with infantile hemangioma should be offered propranolol? What is the dose? How long should we give them? And what is the uh, period over which we can expect clinical improvement? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sidibar Sundari. That was a nice presentation. So basically, infantile hemangioma, it, it usually does not occur at birth. Very rare to see a congenital infantile hemangioma. But it starts developing by the two or three months and slowly starts proliferating. And then you have an involutory stage also. And uh, you have to see whether it is superficial. Now, the superficial ones will just look, you know, flat, reddish. And when it comes to the deeper ones, and 
probably when there is, you know, then it becomes a little more nodular and you could have a bluish tint. And until we talked about uh, propranolol for hemangioma, it was always a systemic corticosteroids and a dosage of uh, three to four milligrams or sometimes even five milligrams per kilogram body weight, especially when it is going to be periorifacial in the danger zone or it is something which is going to interfere with the day-to-day -day quality of life of the child. You know, perianal and perioral and uh, over the nose, near the eyelids. You know, these were the conditions which were requiring systemic corticosteroids. And once we started using propranolol, because propranolol is supposed to decrease the VGF and that is how it is supposed to happen. And normally you start with a dosage of uh, one gram per, per, kilo, per kilogram per day. This should be, it becomes into three divided doses. So that becomes point, 0 0.33. And uh, on the side effects of propranol will be, you have to definitely watch for, you know, bradycardia and hypotension and hypoglycemia. So initially it was always under, you know, supervision, the first day at least, and then subsequently they started giving, you know, oral also. And uh, which are the conditions where you have to see, if you have to, the, looking at the size and whether it is going to be, you know, enlarging proliferative phase, we definitely have to give propranolol. And how long do we give? Usually, as this child, they started, you know, showing some improvement around three to four months. And But there have been conditions when a child needs to be for even six to eight months also. And the other option that we, I would like to give is, you know, when it is very uh, superficial and uh, you could even go in for giving uh, topical timolol eye drops is available. Topical timolol eye drops, two to three drops twice daily. And that also gives good results. In fact, I've had a child with uh, segmental lesions of, I mean, hemangioma, and who really responded. She had a mixed type, a little superficial and little deep. You can always do an ultrasound and see the high flow. That is one way you can monitor and you can monitor the response with uh, ultrasound, periodical ultrasound also. So topical femolol is also one of those options that we can consider without giving proper analog. Which of the patients should be... Sorry, sorry, sir. So, what's the role of uh, atinolol, madam? Can you use atinolol also? No, that's uh, we can have a studies for the atinolol. Yes, sir. There have been um, few studies on giving atinolol also. There was a clinical response to atinolol also. Actually. Thank Madam you. Ma this child had a lesion in the hand as well. So, which patients with hemangioma should we be screening for internal hemangiomas? Would an ultrasound of the liver be in order in children with multiple hemangiomas? Hemangiomas over the face, definitely, yes, you have to have. I was about to come to that, actually. So, hemangiomas over the face, you have to have. You have to think about the faces syndrome. We talk about the faces syndrome, posterior fossa anomalies and uh, hemangiomas and arterial anomalies of the cranial vasculature and uh, coaptation of iota. And uh, uh, these are things which we have to, especially if it is going to be in the mandibular, you can even have associated cardiac anomalies. So, something which is over the face, skull, and then if it is over the uh, ear, uh, nasal tip can be more prone for scarring. Abdominal, yes, definitely we have to have an ultrasound also done. And uh, periodical monitoring is also required. Do these lesions recur after the SP, they respond, ma'am? Yeah. yeah I just, one thing, the clue for to this child, you know, for ulceration to be associated with an infantile hemangioma, you mentioned about a petit cake. The mother had noticed the reddish discoloration in the skin initially and then subsequently. Now, this is the area which is more prone for ulceration because of the constant friction and maceration over there. Would, would these lesions recur after stopping the propranol? That was the question. Oh, no, no. Sorry, I didn't get the question. Yeah. Yeah, it, I mean, lesions do not recur actually. Once it is, uh, I mean, in, in uh, spontaneous resolution, I mean, with treatment, you see to this extent, it does not recur again. Because okay. normally okay. what happens is when the clinical course of infant and manual, if you see, 30% uh, of the lesions will respond by three years, 50% of the lesions, even spontaneous resolution can be there by five years and 70% by seven years actually. But there are no other associated anomalies involved elsewhere. The other question is how to differentiate from a vascular malformation. So always when you see an infantile image, you must see whether it is compressible and you have to look for brui as well. And vascular malformation will be compressible, brui will be hurt and it will be present at birth. And you could always have associated venous abnormalities. If you think in terms of lipid pinani, you will have to look for unilateral enlargement. There could be an asymmetry in the limb girdle. And apart from that, venous enlargement can also be there. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tapur Sandhani. Thank you, sir. We can go on to the next presentation. Uh, Dr. Dr. Tapur Yeah. 
நெக்ஸ்ட் யாருங்க நெக்ஸ்ட் will call uh, Dr. Pridarshini is there. Okay, okay. Dr. Pridarshini, please. Dr. Pridarshini is there. Dr. Pridarshini? No, no. Dr. Bala from Sennan uh, Valley. Yeah, she has um, started to screen. Yeah. No. Bringing everyone. Sin. Yeah, please proceed, doctor. Please proceed. Good evening, everyone. I am Dr. Priya Dachni, second year DNP resident from uh, Krishna Maternity Home and Pediatric Center, uh, Sunal Veli. Uh, here, I'm uh, here. I am uh, present uh, to present some of the uh, rare but com also common cases. Uh, first of all, uh, first case is a term ne male neonate. Who presented with extensive skin peeling with uh, blister formation since day one of life. Uh, this peeling of skin was affected about twenty uh, percent of the body surface area. Oral mucus uh, mucosal involvement was also present. Uh, below the knee, there were flaccid bullae formation. Nikolsky sign was positive, but uh, sepsis marker uh, were negative. Sir? Yes, I've completed my case one, sir. First, uh, she has completed the case one. Uh, come, please, uh, you can ask uh, just to come in. Yes. Uh, Dr. Kathikian, sir? Dr. Kathikian? Madhu ma'am, can you be a, can, can you take the question please then? Eh? You are not able to connect to Dr. Kathy Kane. Madam, Dr. Madhu Madhu, unmute Madhu. Uh, now she was mentioning about a neonate with extensive skin peeling and blister formation from day one of life. Okay. And uh, normally it, it, it seems to be more in the acral regions. So one of the first differential diagnoses that we have to consider would be epidermolysis bullosa, the mechanobullous disorders. And subsequently, I mean, other differential diagnosis that we have to consider is we have to think about whether it could be a congenital configured vulgaris. And you know, congenital configured vulgaris, because you mentioned about oral mucosa, but in the case of epidermolysis bullosa, again, we know that it can be epidermolysis bullosa simplex, wherein we'll have lesions only on the skin. Whereas if it is going to be junctional or dystrophic, then you have to look at the oral mucosa and the nails as well. And uh, with Symphagus vulgaris, we have blisters all over the uh, body. And usually, congenital Symphagus vulgaris is when the maternal Symphagus antibodies have come to the baby. So you have to look for the history of you know, Symphagus vulgaris in the mother. And apart from that, bullae in a child, in a newborn baby, syphilis, congenital syphilis, yes. And uh, as far as epidermolysis bullosa comes from the first diagnosis, it's more common in the case of uh, normal deliveries. And as this baby becomes uh, older, again, you know, we'll have to all the frictional signs will be more prone for blister formation. So it's very important to give a proper nursing care, proper counseling to the parents, and you have to take care of the bullet as well. And when you see multiple bullet, normally it's best to just puncture the bullet and leave it for a biological uh, dressing, actually. It, once a denuded bullet, it goes in for secondary bacterial infection. If you see an intact bullet, you just have to fix it with, I mean, pierce it with a sterile needle and leave it over the roof and act as a biological dressing. And, and uh, frequent uh, emollient application is very important. And as the child grows, again, you know, you have to keep it from uh, getting injured. That is very, very important. So padded dressings and uh, cotton mittens, all those things have to be advised.
Ma'am, this is something very emotionally distressing for the parents to see. So immediately the question comes, why was the antenatal scan not capable of picking this up first? Second is, they want some idea about the prognosis. So on clinical grounds, are there pointers to make a diagnosis between the epidermal type, the junction type, and the dermal dystrophic type? Is it possible to look at some pointers and tell them this child is going to do slightly better than some other child? Definitely, sir. If you just have to look at the nails. When there is nail involvement, you definitely think this is more of a junction or a dystrophic. And these are the babies who can, you know, go in for more of uh, esophageal involvement. And it, it is more morbid condition and quality of life may not be great as such. But if you look at the normal days and if you have limited lesions of, you know, uh, bulla and start healing well, you can always say, but only thing is the, the um, nutrition is important. <laughs> And how we take care of the child is important. And these days, you have a lot of dressings as well, silicone dressings, and we talk about the collagen membrane dressings. With these dressings, these children definitely do well, actually. But a lot of counseling, hand holding is very, very important because, especially when they maybe start growing up in, the, in, in a toddler, infantile stage also. So the child, baby might, you know, start crawling and will be more prone for infection. So you have to keep the area very, uh, I mean, uh, Injury less zone that is very, very important. Injury less is very, very important. And even feeding for that matter, if there are going to be oral mucosolutions, solutions, sometimes you know you can even have to apply a, just a, a liquid paraffin or something which can you know de, uh, reduce the damage to the mucosa. That is very important. Ma'am, when they ask for genetic counseling, can, can we establish the diagnosis by, by skin biopsy or does it need genetic diagnosis? Is there some rule to prognosticate? Are they dominant recessive? How do we give them counseling, ma'am? So these days, genetic is definitely possible. We have, uh, the thing is, it's not widely available in all centers, but I think it's available in CMC and uh, Bangalore. We have centers, and uh, that gives them uh, sort of an idea how to, you know, uh, at least to plan uh, subsequent babies, actually. Thank you. Do a biopsy and go for genetic counseling. Oh, thank you. Dr. Priya, can you go on to the second case, ma'am? Second case, uh, it is a uh, she's a 14 years old girl who presented with fever and skin rash. Uh, this rash is uh, rapidly progressed into a generalized erythematous rash with facial uh, puffiness. She was thought to be suffering from viral exanthematous illness. When uh, the father was probed with history, uh, he revealed that uh, the uh, child was treated with uh, tablet ibuprofen uh, for the fever. In next 24 hours, her condition deteriorated with extension of lesions affecting more than 95% of body surface area, which turned purpuric and tender. Nicole's sign was positive. She also uh, developed this and oral and gentle mucus. Dr. Kartike. Dr. Kartike. Uh, sir? Is this? Ah, uh, tell me, tell me, sir. Tell me, sir. No. Uh, I think uh, we lost you initially, sir. Are you okay no, to I, take I, the I, question? I'm, I'm audible. Am I audible now? Yes, sir. You are audible, sir. Your yes, comments yes. on this uh, child, sir. Uh, this typical is a case of uh, TEN. We talk about TEN. Already we discussed partially about TEN. I think there yes, is... Sir. Uh, TN as such is not very common in uh, infants and uh, young children. It is more common in uh, adolescents and pre-adolescent age group. Uh, this TN actually, if you see, uh, prognosis is a bit better in children when compared to adults if you intervene a bit early. That is one important factor you should remember. And when you diagnose or suspect TN early, that is very, very important because uh, you have to intervene very early. You should not start treatment once sepsis intervenes. You delay the treatment for three to four days. Uh, mortality increases dramatically with every day. So before sepsis intervenes, you have to give a start treating. And the differential diagnosis already we discussed. Staphylococcal scarlet syndrome is a close differential diagnosis. But this age is typical of a, a TEN. And what is certain factors which you should remember in TEN is once you diagnose TN, you have to manage it as an emergency. So it is an emergency and it has to be managed appropriately. So admission 
and man general management, particularly fluids and prevention of sepsis, and what we call as a barrier nursing. It is very, very important. It should be treated like a burns, more than a burns, because here the onslaught continues. We say in a burns, onslaught is once. You have a physical injury and it stops there. But here it's an onslaught goes on. The T cells keep repeatedly attacking the skin. And the cause most probably is a drug. The most important thing I, I always stress is you have to get a proper history. Most of the TEN is caused by drugs. And you have to get a proper history of drugs. Most of the patients will not tell you. It could be just an over-the-counter drug, like an ordinary septran. And many a times we find it is given in GH. We use septrans, septran very commonly. So cotrimoxol is so commonly for any ordinary infection also. So, But we see this is one of the most notorious drugs which can produce TEN. So you should ask them the history and see that if they have taken drugs, like common drugs like cotrimoxol, or it could be an analgesic. It could be given by a uh, person who gives an injections. It can be an injection given uh, by a pharmacist or just like that one, analgesic injection, which can uh, precipitate a TN. Another important group of drugs is anti-epileptics. This is very important. Anti-epileptics is important because it can also produce TN, particularly carbazepine, what we call aromatic anti-epileptics, like carbazepine, phenytoin, phenobarbital. That group of drugs are very notorious. And anti-tuberculous drugs. Because these are the very commonly used drugs which can produce uh, TEN and it can be very severe. So, Sir, it is important. Dr. Prejeshi said, said that there was a history of exposure to ibuprofen, sir. Uh, what are uh, the, I told common you, for us to use ibuprofen, sir? It's analgesics are also important uh, group of drugs. But if you put an order, if you have an order of priority, analgesics comes maybe third or fourth. Maybe analysis are very commonly used. It can produce NSIDs. Uh, it can produce TEN. But NSIDs are notorious, particularly uh, ibuprofen and uh, acyclofenac or uh, diclofenac. These group of drugs also can produce. And uh, the these uh, TEN produce depends. It varies. Actually, I saw a question which they asked, how do you differentiate TEN from Dress syndrome? There was a question which I saw in the box. It is important that you identify differentiate between TEN and Dress syndrome. Dress syndrome is a group which you may not find the positive Nikolsky. You may find cutaneous lesions in the uh, trunk. And more important thing is you find systemic abnormalities, particularly derangements in the liver, liver functions. That is very classical you find in Dress. So systemic involvement is very common in Dress syndrome. And Dress syndromes are commonly with anticonvulsants, Sulfonamides, we have seen with Dapsone syndrome, which has been described with Dapsone, commonly we give for leprosy. So this is one group of disorders uh, we call as dress syndrome, when there is a systemic manifestation. TEN primarily has cutaneous manifestation, but systemic manifestations may occur later, particularly patient may develop sepsis and sepsis-related uh, complications which can occur. So you have to identify, and both require a similar sort of treatment. I think we are going to discuss about it a bit later, but this I thought we should stress on history taking, what we call as a temporal profile. If you can write a graph, so see when the drug has been given. A uh, big problem comes particularly in polypharmacy when you give multiple drugs are given. So there is one sulfonamide or antibiotic, one NSAID, both together. Then you have to take a call and see which has a higher uh, um, chance. There is a criteria we call Najos criteria where we find out which has a higher chance of producing TEN or which drug has produced the adverse drug reaction. So you can use that and try to find out because that drug should be isolated. The last question on this topic, are we as pediatricians uh, liable to be prosecuted in the court of law for having written a drug which the child has reacted adversely to? Is there a medical legal implication for this? Uh, definitely there is no medical legal implication because if you have used it in the accurate uh, indication. If there is a definite indication for that disease and you have the documents very clear. Particularly, we had faced quite a few cases, more so with uh, Dapsone. I still remember on Dapsone syndrome when I was in Jipma, it went to court, the newspaper, and it was uh, so much hue and cry about a uh, patient. Was diagnosed with leprosy and Dapsone was given. Developed severe Dapsone syndrome, a hepatitis, and the child succumbed. So there was, in the court, it was declared that the drug has been given for a definite indication and this are not uh, expected. 
Yeah. But there have been cases which have gone against. Uh, you know about the famous Calcutta court, where uh, T N patient was given a very uh, big uh, uh, compensation. Uh, there was one case, but ideally, if you have your documents very clear, indications are very very clear. That is very important. So that can save you a lot. And legally, you don't have any implication, idleness, and otherwise, you give for a unindicated condition or you don't have documents properly given. That is the problem. So may Thank I? You. Thank you. Sir. Uh, so may I? Yeah. Hello. Yes, ma'am. Please, please, your comments are welcome. So may, um, it is always important to mention in your prescription about no history of any known drug allergy. So that is one thing which should be present in all prescriptions these days. And to add to the drugs list, again, maybe quinolins also. Supraflos is also supposed to be very notorious for causing toxic epidemiologists. And when you talk about IV gamma globulin, now this is one place where you will think about IV gamma globulin rather than, you know, SSS. Thank you. Dr. Priya, can we go on to case number three, ma'am? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Our next case is an uh, uh, eight years old boy who presented with prolonged fever with rashes. On examination, he appeared to be emaciated. He also had violaceous macules over uh, upper eyelids and cheek. Uh, firm papules of size 2 cross 2 centimeters over extensive surface of elbow. Investi other investigations revealed uh, severe pneumonia, which eventually progressed to empyema. So. Madhu, ma'am, when a child comes with uh, such skin nodules, a certain papule of 2 into 2 extensive surface, what are the differentials that one needs to consider? It's a fairly large size. Uh, is that. Right. Now, as far as this child goes, she's mentioned about having violaceous macules over the upper eyelids and there are firm papules over the extensive surfaces of the elbow. You would also have to look at the knuckles and you'll have to see whether the child has difficulty in getting up the proximal muscle weakness. So that will be really for dermatomyositis. But say if this child had fever with rashes all over the body and there is a butterfly rash on the face and there are some painless oral ulcers and there is arthralgia, and of course, as a fever, then maybe you'll have to think about the systemic lupus epidemiosis. So either way, connective tissue disorders is very, very important to rule out in such a child who presents with fever and a rash. And as far as the rash goes, you have to look at the distribution of the rash. You can have mala rash, you can have something disparate rash and epimatous rash all over the body. And here we, this we talk about the Gottwin's uh, papules over the elbow, you can have calcinosis pupus. That is again is very common in dermatomyositis. So you have to rule out, I mean, you start investigations in the light of panic tissue disorders for these children. Look at the ESR, look at the CBC, look, at, look for uh, leukopenia and uh, thrombocytopenia, do a uh, AMA, DSD, so on and so forth. Do we need a muscle biopsy to establish a diagnosis in such children, ma'am? Would that be a skin be a easier organ to biopsy, or is a clinical diagnosis we can treat based no, on our finding? We can do the enzyme CPK and LDH, and once you do a AMA profile, not necessarily always you should go for muscle biopsy, and we start responding to treatment once you start with uh, skinny corticosteroids and hydroxychloroquine. How do we differentiate these uh, nodules from uh, what we see in uh, tendon transform of hyperlipidemia? Man? This two centimeter and two centimeter papules over the elbow. So xanthomas, typically you will have that yellowish hue. And here in this calcinosis cutis condition that we see in dermatomyositis, firm nodules. And uh, you will sometimes you can even see these calcareous deposits over there actually. So that is uh, one differentiating point. Whereas xanthomas are usually they stay soft to form in consistency with a yellowish hue. And then, of course, when you do a lipid profile, you'll typically be able to pick up the xanthomas. Any comments have... on to why this child had pneumonia and empyema, ma'am? Are children with dermatomyositis uh, immunosuppressed or it's an incidental finding? No, immunosuppression possibility, whether this child was already on corticosteroids for a longer time and the uh, immunocompromised state definitely predisposes to further uh, you know, other infections. Thank you. Dr. Priya? Yes, sir. Can I, can, can I add one point? Can I do yes, add one point? Yes, sir, yes, sir please, sir. Um, uh, dermatomyositis uh, group is a unique because they are more prone for vasculitis. Childhood dermatomyositis, when you have to compare from adulthood, 
they are more prone to vasculitic lesions so and they develop something called as calcinosis universalis so they develop calcinosis of the trunk the thighs and this very classical thing calcinosis universalis if you take a photograph uh, sorry you take a x ray you find that armor like uh, calcification which occurs in the body and trunk and they are more prone for vasculitis so many of these children who have childhood dermatomyositis their prognosis is very poor they have multiple complications and we already discussed pneumonia rashes because of the vasculitis which occurs it can be systemic vasculitis they have this problems so they are more prone for recurrent infections they have um, growth retardation nutritional compromise and they succumb very easily to the drugs because we have to start very uh, high dose of steroids and other immunosuppressive they succumb very easily so it's a very tough condition to manage childhood dermatomyositis yes thank you thank you thanks for your thank you dr prayeshni for those three wonderful cases ma very well worked up and very lucidly thank you thank you sir thank you sir next uh, dr sasikla from uh, dr sasikla Ma'am, you can go for. Yeah, you can. Uh, please proceed. Good evening, all my respected seniors. Today, I am going to present a case of acute necrotic skin lesions. Coming to the presentation, eight months old female child brought by parents came with chief complaints of uh, fever for five days, cough and cold for five days, breathlessness for two days. There was no history of any melina or bleeding manifestations, no history of altered level of consciousness, no history of any bad child rearing practices. Coming to the clinical examination, the baby was found to be lethargic fibril paler was present baby was tachypneic chest in drawing with subcostal retractions were present baby had hepatomegaly with a liver span of 8 cm pulse volume was good blood pressure was 80 or 60 there was ecchymotic patches present over the posterior aspect of both thighs so this is the clinical picture showing the ecchymotic patches over both thighs coming to the investigations the baby had neutrophilic leukocytosis anemia thrombocytopenia rft was normal sgot showed mild elevation initially coagulation profile was normal blood cultures were sent during hospital stay the baby had uh, persistent fever spikes and respiratory distress and also developed shock the child had progression of ecchymotic patches to the lower back lower limbs and upper limbs serial investigation showed decreasing platelet count and alteration of coagulation profile blood cultures yielded no growth so with the above clinical findings we made a differential diagnosis of sepsis mainly due to meningococcemia perfura pulmonans epidermal necrolysis and toxic shock syndrome we obtained a dermatology opinion they told it was a case of uh, perfura pulmonans so we made a final diagnosis of sepsis with perfura pulmonans we treated the child with oxygen through nasal prongs adequate hydration with iv fluids for shock we correct for shock we treated with iv boluses and dopamine support antibiotics we treated with piperazine amikacin and lenizolid for altered coagulation profile we transfused ffp 15 ml per kg for 4 uh, days we obtained pediatric surgeon opinion also he advised conservative management with topical antiseptic cream application after st stabilization the child was shifted to ward for completion of antibiotics for 14 days dr rajalakshmi can we can take a break here can you go back to the previous two slides ma the picture we we'll leave it there so that the moderators can give us their expert comment the previous one ma the next one the next picture ma the next no oh, the, the one with uh, yes please leave it madhu ma'am can you have can we have your comment on how to approach a child with such extensive perfuric and hemorrhagic lesions in the skin we have seen quite a few of these uh, hemorrhagic lesions how do we differentiate this from the previously discussed ones 
Yeah, no, this is the child who seems to be very sick and started as an achematic patches and subsequently goes in for those necrotic areas. So we definitely have to consider purpura fulminans. Now in purpura fulminans, in the case of neonatal, you can have again protein C or protein S deficiency, in neonatal purpura fulminans, they could be idiopathic and most of the times it could be in infectious purpura, uh, post-infectious purpura fulminans, probably which could be the case in this particular child. And uh, what is important is to treat the underlying infection and give fresh frozen plasma. So fresh frozen plasma is very, very important because you know we are talking about uh, protein C or protein S deficiency, protein S deficiency, and uh, the wound care is also important. And uh, persistent uh, thrombocytopenia. In the case of DIC, in the case of DIC, which is again another intravascular thrombotic disorder, you will have to, you know, the, the child will be more prone for thrombotic episodes and uh, in the serum fibrogen levels we have to monitor and there could be definite multiple bleeding tendency and a rapid deterioration. And uh, other, actually PETK we talk about means again, uh, if it is going to be idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura, you can get purpuras and sometimes it's like hemosis, but only thing is it will not go with, you know, to such necrosis and with worsening general condition. Ma'am, in your experience, how often is meningococcemia actually? Do, do we see such patients here? Do we see meningococcemia in our part of the country, ma'am? Uh, not in my experience. Sir. I mean, because, but one thing is, uh, generally, because in, I'm in uh, Madras Medical College, where we do not see the pediatric patients. All the pediatric patients are admitted in ICH. So when there is a very sick baby, then of course, we do have followers, but I have not come across uh, meningococcemia. Should one consider in a place like uh, Chennai with uh, close uh, scrub jungles, rickettsial infections, ma'am, can scrub present like this with diffuse uh, vasculitis? Yeah, in scrub, scrub, actually, you start looking for the ester, isn't it? And uh, you, I mean, with fever, with petechial rash, it's definitely possible. But there again, it, it does not go in for the rapid progression in necrosis, what we see in this particular child. Are we to understand the purpura fulminance and DAC are overlapping conditions or DAC is a part of purpura fulminance, ma'am? The worsening part of it is DAC, sir. That's when okay. it begins with purpura fulminance and then surface. Yes. Dr. Rajalachmi, can you complete the case first, ma'am? So we treated the child with uh, oxygen, IV fluids, dopamine, antibiotics, piperazilin, amikazine, and lenisolid. Uh, we transfused the baby with FFP, 15 ml per kg for four days. Pediatric surgeon opinion was obtained. He suggested conservative management with the topical antiseptic cream application. After stabilization of the child, the child was shifted to ward for completion of antibiotics. This is the clinical picture showing the child at the time of discharge. Thank you, sir. Wonderful. Thank you. Wonderful. So, one well thing, can add on, sir, just one thing. In the case of DIC, you can always ask them to look for the peripheral smear, where you look for the schistocytes. That is one early indication for, you know, looking for an onset of DIC. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. Can we go on to the next presentation? Dr. Lajanachmi, you can stop screen sharing, ma'am. Dr. Lakshmi Shanti and Dr. Harshavardhani are there. Yes, sir. Dr. Lakshmi Shanti, Dr. Harshavardhani. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, either of you could present, ma. Dr. Harsha, are you ready with your case presentation? Yes, sir. I am ready, sir. Yeah, you can start screen sharing. Ma. Yes, sir. Screen is visible, sir. I'll start, sir. Yes, ma'am, please. Yes. Thank you, sir. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. So we've seen so many high fi cases. I chose to present a very simple one today. Uh, uh, it was a two-year-old boy, developmentally normal, immunized up to date, who presented with complaints of rashes present for uh, uh, one week. 
so this child the uh, rashes initially started around the mouth which progressed to involve the face and then the upper part of chest also and had a yellowish orange discoloration as per the mother no no history of fever irritability or carousel symptoms and the child was already managed with oral covamaxicla for about 5 days along with topical antibiotics before presenting to us so uh, you can see the child the child was alert active hemodynamically stable the local examination showed multiple ulcerative ruptured vesicular lesions that were uh, noted over the face especially around the mouth and there were also scattered confluent lesions over the forehead cheeks and upper part of the chest which had the classical uh, honey crusting and there was uh, no mucosal involvement systemic examination was uh, uh, normal so we you can take a, a break here ma yeah sure sir dr kartike sir oh. this is a uh, i think uh, we should uh, congratulate the doctor for bringing up a common case which uh, during this summer you are bound to see day in and day out so this is a very typical presentation of uh, uh, what we call as impetigo contagiosa or it caused commonly by the streptococcus group but you can have another variant due caused by staphylococcus also we we have a type of varnish colored crust a bit different and they may have even bullous lesions so this typical presentation the child is brought to we have already started seeing such cases in the opd because the summer is very hot the main thing you have to differentiate this from i already told you you have a staphylococcal lesions if you have bullous lesions always seek, uh, check whether they have that what we call half and half you find the bulla with pus or hype in the axis be very careful we are dealing with a staphylococcal uh, type of impetigo if it's going to be staphylococcal we have seen the child developing uh, staphylococcus scarlet skin syndrome so you have to be very clear while starting what antibiotic you have to start if you have any doubt you can do a gram strain and you can see the typical organisms but empirically start with a drug which will also cover the uh, staphylococcal uh, group of uh, organisms so that will be better to so start with the cloxacillin or that group of drugs it works better and one more point you have to remember is you have to uh, advise the child about the hygiene they have to take bath regularly and uh, more so avoid sugary food like chocolates ice creams and this type of sugary food they should avoid and keep their hygiene careful one more important point you have to see is avoid too much of playing in hot sun and that's sweat and this adds to the whole uh, scenario of developing impetigo uh, contagiosa this case is what we see something very interesting we see nowadays is something called we have already written an article on this what is called impetigo incognito incognito means the morphology what classically has been described like honey colored crust it doesn't occur because what happens now you find over the counter you see more the parents the non steroid antifungal combination from the uh, pharmacy and then apply on the skin lesions when they apply the on the skin lesions what happens the morphology totally changes you don't develop have the honey colored crust you have a sort of crusting mild scaling and the picture is very different and it starts spreading very fast all over the body this may cause a diagnostic confusion particularly to a primary care physician they may think what is this disease it's not a classical impetigo contagiosa which we are seeing for years now so we have this condition which we called as impetigo incognito that morphology has been changed because of the steroids in these patients we have to give systemic antibiotics along with topical antibiotics when you have a suspicion that could be an impetigo component in it always give a topical and systemic antibiotic and obviously hygiene and uh, proper bath and other things so i think this point i wanted to bring out and that's why i appreciated when she brought this case to always think of this impetigo incognito which is a steroid modified impetigo thank you dr kathigan thanks for the inputs sir we lost your audio when you said half and half can you kindly clarify the question sir ah th that's half and half what happens particularly you have vesicular lesions in these children and you find half and half means there is a fluid and half of it is pus and half of it is clear fluid you find this half and half pus hypopion like pus particularly in bullous impetigo which is caused by staphylococcal so when staphylococcal impetigo occurs 
it may have this half and half lesions, which give a diagnostic clue. And so we should be careful because these patients may develop staphylococcal scarlet's syndrome. That's what I wanted to highlight. This is hypopion. Okay. Half and half means you find vesicles with uh, clear fluid and pus. Thank you, sir. And uh, the market has flooded with uh, topical antibiotics, each one claiming to be superior to the other, sir. We have a bewildering array of uh, locally available medicines, starting from our old mupiracin to framycetin to neomycin to nadifloxacin. Is there really an advantage or superiority in one topical agent over another? Two, when would we want us to consider systemic antibiotics rather than topical antibiotics? Uh, this uh, always time-tested and very efficacious, even now with mupiracin. So th they, though the market is flooded with newer drugs, they want to introduce newer antibiotics and things. Uh, mupirocin is very effective and there is no better alternative for mupirocin. You can consider some other uh, antibiotic also, but the first priority will be still mupirocin. That is one factor. Next, systemic antibiotics. If the impetigo is extensive, it is all over the face, trunk, multiple lesions are there, then we can go for systemic. If you suspect there is a staphylococcal origin, that's what I already told you, better go for systemic rather than just giving topical um, antibiotics. And if the child has fever or signs of mild sepsis, which can occur, then we go in for systemic uh, antibiotics. So these are the indications for systemic antibiotics. Next to a very silly question, sir. How do we exactly tell the parents to apply the ointment? How much appointment to be applied over the skin? How frequently, sir? Should the area be washed to remove the pus uh, before the eye? Yes. First thing is you always ask them to give a saline compress and remove the dressings. The normal saline is good enough. A lukewarm water with a pinch of salt. Not too much of salt into it because it will irritate. A lukewarm water and a pinch of salt. And with that, you can use a clean cloth and just apply it over the uh, lesions and try to remove the crust as much as possible. The child is not cooperating try to keep the compress for some time and the crust will automatically fall when it gets hydrated. Then you can apply the mupirocin twice daily, whatever. They can use it the fingertips. We call it the fingertips and just should cover the lesion and a bit beyond. So you can cover the lesion and wherever, wherever lesions are there, they can apply. Twice is better. So it is applied in the morning and the evening because the ointments will tend to get uh, washed off or any other purpose. So we can use it twice and just on the lesion. It should cover the lesion completely and there should form a film on it. Okay. And okay. there was a question actually one person has asked about K104, a Condi's compress, okay. which we call Condi's compress. Uh, it's a very effective agent. Uh, we use in the percentage of 1 is to 8,000. That is the concentration. Because it's very tough to measure that concentration, always we tell them, if you use condies that came in for crystals and use it in a clean water, and the color should be like a rose, rose color. Rose color, it's a pink color, not the red rose. So it should be pink color. It's like a, uh, what we call as that the fragrant pink rose. Uh, though in Tamil, we call the not rose, uh, panni rose. So it should be that color. So that color is the typical color. It's important because when you use a higher concentration of KMNO4, you may develop chemical burns, which may actually act in the reverse way. So you should be very careful while advising. KMNO4 is very efficacious because it gives a nascent oxygen, which can kill all the bacteria. It is a good antiseptic and it's time-tested one. But you should use it in an educated patient who will apply it properly. So unless you educate them and give the proper things, you may land up with chemical burns, which can be a bigger problem rather than treating with KMNO4. So that point should be remembered. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Dr. Uh, Asha, you can complete the case presentation now. Yes, And go on. Um, so DD setting, sir, has already discussed uh, uh, a common DD for herpes simplex and varicella zoster uh, and then SSSS, but there was no systemic involvement. Others were, can be folliculitis, ectema and contact dermatitis, but then these look classical compared to all the three. They look classical like impetigo. So we went ahead and uh, proceeded with oral antibiotics because of uh, more extensive involvement than what will be expected, something that's usually around mouth. So we gave cephalexin at uh, 50 mg per kg per day, oral zinc uh, for uh, 
uh, healing uh, the skin areas and the topical antibiotics with mupirocin 2% was given saline soaks to uh, remove the crusting and then uh, because staphylococcus is a common uh, uh, organism that is implicated we also did eradication of carrier state by using topical mupirocin both for the patient and the contacts in the family perinasal periumbilical and perineal for 3 weeks thank you dr hasha for highlighting and presenting very elegantly something which we commonly manage and mismanage on a daily basis that is why we included this common case scenario so that uh, errors can be avoided in the future thank you thank you thank you sir dr lakshmi shanti uh, yes sir uh, good evening one and all yeah uh, good evening one and all this is dr lakshmi shanti from coimbatore uh, So first of all, I would like to congratulate IAP TNSE for coming up with this unique uh, program of the crispy craze uh, presentations, which has been uh, like introduced uh, a few months back, and uh, wherein they give uh, chances for both the PGs and the practicing pediatricians and discuss it with an expert panel, which has been very useful. Thank Dr. Rajendran sir and uh, Ashwath sir for being coordinators for this program. Is my screen visible, sir? Yes. Just a minute, sir. Yeah, you can go for a slide, sir, more please. Ah, yes. Okay. So yes. I, uh, so this is more like a spotter case. So I wanted to share this case because of the rarity and the size of the lesion. Uh, so this uh, child, girl, child, one year and one month old, uh, female child, which was from our PHC area. it was uh, born out of a non consanguineous marriage to a primary mother it was a full term normal delivery at a nearby a birth weight of 3 kg and a normal abgar it ha the baby was found to have a large hyperpigmented mole covering most of the back otherwise uh, the baby was uh, developmentally normal so the milestones were normal and the baby came for the regular vaccination checkups and uh, the birth uh, weight and the height and all the parameters uh, grew up to the percentiles so uh, this is the picture of the uh, lesion so the first one shows the lesion at birth and this is like uh, it should be around 6 to 8 months wherein we have seen uh, more satellite lesions so to explain Madhumat? yeah So, we can take a pause here, Dr. Lakshmi. Madhu, ma'am, yes, yes, how sir. do we differentiate a condition which is hyperpigmented at birth, uh, which is a nevus, and something which is uh, 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 just a Mongolian spot, ma'am? Please, please educate us on how to differentiate a Mongolian spot from a nevus. Yeah, now Mongolian spot basically it's a double pigmentation. You will look at more of the bluish tinge. So even you have a bluish uh, patch over the body, and that is typical for Mongolian spots. Whereas in the case of your melanocytic nevus is more of a black pigmented, and sometimes you you are able to make out the rugosities as well. Now this is a congenital melanocytic nevus, and which is a uh, uh, actually more than twenty c- uh, centimeters. You know, it, uh, it it's uh, part of the bath suit nevus also sometimes. So this is something where this particular child definitely needs to be followed up because in the case congenital melanocytic, you talk about the small, medium, and the large melanocytic nevus. and uh, how do you monitor these children when it is going to be small you just have to observe the child periodically look for any asymmetry or irregularity or any history of bleeding tendency and that is the time you have to say you have to go for an excision whether smaller ones you can always go in for excision and when a child presents like this it will be worthwhile to have an uh, you know ultrasound done and uh, uh, ct scan done also and uh, these children we have to mention the uh, parents that you know they have need a follow for a long term because there could be a small percentage of them going for melanoma so the periodic monitoring is very important and then subsequently surgical intervention is important are there any pointers to say or a time frame ma'am if they undergo malignant melanoma degeneration will be in the pediatric age group or be in the adult age group usually it's rare in the pediatric age group they say 1 to 3 percent age but it is always important to tell them about what you look for when the stagnation starts suddenly increasing all the more when the rugosity becomes irregularity becomes all the more asymmetric and there is itching or there is bleeding 
and those are the I mean will be the pointers for you know immediate intervention. What Dr. Lakshmi Shanti is saying is something very gross, ma'am. But in general, the common garden variety of Neva, what would the pediatrician be expected to be worried about? When do we worry about a Neva? What Neva should worry us? That's what when there is a localized melanocytic Neva, which we call it a small. Okay, you just have to say, okay, fine. We don't have to worry at this site, and you you have to look out for those pointers which I have mentioned already. But this is one child. But again, we do not interfere when the baby is going to be two months or three months old. So you have to wait until at least two years. And then subsequently, maybe you should start thinking about surgical interventions. Okay. Thank you. The Dr. other thing Lakshmi. I wanted to add on, uh, sorry, sir, regarding the uh, saline compressors, you know, which we had discussed earlier, homemade saline solutions, you can ask them to use a half a liter of lukewarm water and one spoon of salt. And then a cotton cloth, which can be four folded. That gives you an ideal uh, good outcome, actually. Ma'am, you also mentioned the need for an ultrasound and imaging. Can you clarify why they would be in order, ma'am? No, subsequently, I mean, if at all you want to rule out any other associated uh, disorders involved, so it would be worthwhile to have a, a screening. Okay. Uh, can I add one point? Yes, Kati. Can I add one point? Please, please, sir. Uh, one important thing is. Uh, I think you have to educate the parents. There will be increased hair growth over this nevi because the patients, uh, it, the parents become very apprehensive because there will be dense hair growth and sometimes it can be a bit irritating. So what we can advise them is you should shampoo over the body because they will, all these nevi, melanocytic nevi will have a very dense hair growth on them. So to take care of that, because if you don't use ordinary soap and other things, sometimes there can be mild irritation on it. So use a shampoo and cleanse and uh, maintenance of particularly this is such a large neve, maintenance of hygiene is very important and they should apply, keep it very clean. Otherwise, uh, you get uh, itching and other uh, lesions over it. You may get even folliculitis because there is a dense hair growth. So that point, you should make it a uh, point to the parents to about that. That's it. Thank you. Thanks for that input. Uh, Dr. Lakshmi, yeah. uh, do you have you. any more slides? Yeah, just to uh, thank you, Dr. Madhu and Dr. Karthi for giving some useful practice points, sir. So this is exactly why I presented the case. So initially at birth, it was a large mole measuring more than uh, 20 to 30 centimeter. So as ma'am said, it will come, come under the category of a large or giant uh, melanocytic nevus with irregular borders. And there were five to six satellite lesions. And uh, during course of time, the lesion increased in size as the child developed and now covers almost... Um, most of the back and lower limbs and as sir said there is hypotrichosis in some areas and there are many satellite lesions have developed over the friend face and limbs and now there are more than 20 satellite lesions sir and uh, uh, during the course of uh, these uh, one year of life the child in between the child developed uh, ulceration and bleeding due to the friction between the folded areas otherwise uh, developmentally uh, normal uh, regarding the investigations, an MRI brain was done at birth to rule, to rule out the involvement of uh, leptomeninges as asymptomatic neurocutaneous melanosis can present in 5 to 25% of these children with uh, high risk CMN because this child comes under a high risk because it has a giant uh, nevus and multiple satellite nevi. An MRI was done at birth. And the other investigations would be uh, dermatoscopy, which could reveal globular pigmentation patterns, and tissue biopsy, which was uh, mostly used due to rule, rule out. Uh, malignant transformation. Uh, these would be the differential diagnosis. So all these are hyperpigmented lesions uh, which may be present at birth or uh, during the first few weeks of life. And uh, as ma'am said, the Mongolian spots, all those, they look uh, very different. And this is a very uh, unique uh, case of congenital melanocytic nevus. So it's a skin lesion characterized by uh -huh. proliferation of nevomelanocytes presence at birth or develops within the first few weeks. It could be classified as small, medium, and large or giant. They can also be classified based on the number of satellite lesions. So uh, large lesions have an increased risk of melanoma, especially a giant lesion has a risk of, uh, I think, 5 to 6% chance of transformation into malignant uh, melanoma. And uh, more than these uh, risk factors, the cosmetic implication and the challenges in surgical excision mm -hmm. Associated symptoms are also there due to itching, ulceration, and bleeding. So these are the uh, treatment-wise surgical and the non-surgical uh, thing available. 
could be a tangential excision, curatagen excision, serial excision and direct closure and excision with reconstruction. So as for this child, they have been made an appointment with CMC Velu, but uh, I think they have been waiting because of the uh, cost involved for this uh, procedure. So take home points for a practicing pediatrician, the follow up the lesions with the serial photographs, like the increase in size and feeling for any change in texture, the ulcers, tenderness, or certain amelanotic area should give us a cue for uh, malignant transformation. And any neurological symptoms like seizures, vomiting, headache should warrant an MRI to rule out the neurocutaneous melanosis. And uh, we should also remember that extracutaneous melanomas can also occur in children. High risk factors for melanoma would be the large or the giant size, multiple satellite nevi, axial or paravertebral location, and neurocutaneous melanosis at presentation. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Lakshmi, for that very lucid presentation of a fairly rare thing. Thank you. Sir. Do we have one more presentation from Dharmapuri? Mm -hmm. Tana, we have one more presentation from uh, Dharmapuri. Yes, sir. Yeah, please, sir, proceed, ma. This will be the last, I think. Good evening, everyone. I am Dr. Rajalakshmi, postgraduate from Government Dermatology Medical College. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Coming to my presentation, a three-month-old infant was brought to her OPD by her mother with complaints of multiple... Uh, Dr. Raj Rajmi, please share your slide, please. It's not uh, displayed. Yeah, it will take some. Sir, Dr. Kartikeyan, sir, uh, regarding uh, uh, dermatomyositis, sir, who are going for biopsy, can we do MRI, sir? Is it uh, useful, sir? So, uh, actually, if you go uh, based on the criteria wise, uh, okay. We don't have definite MRA as a criteria. So we use, uh, you can do a EMG, which will be useful, which okay. is a bit uh, less traumatizing than a biopsy or something. EMG can be done. Okay. Muscle enzymes are a very good because we monitor the disease progression with muscle enzymes. Okay. And uh, then the other immunological really? marker, MRA can be useful, sir. Can be useful. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah, uh, you can go for slides and more, doctor. Dr. Rajalishmi, you can go for slides and mode. If not possible, please proceed. Yeah, yeah, you can. Perfect. Okay, you can go for presentation. Coming to my presentation, a three-month-old infant was brought to her OPD by her mother with complaints of multiple lesions on face, forearm, abdomen, thighs, palms, and soles. The lesion started around four weeks ago initially. Involved palm, involving palms and fora, then later spread to face and abdomen. Child had multiple consultation and was prescribed antihistamines and topical applicants. As the condition did not improve, the child was prescribed steroid by local pharmacist. Mother also complains of itching during night but has no similar lesions. This is the clinical picture. We got dermatologist opinion and confirmed it is the scabies in an infant. 5% permethrin ointment overnight application was prescribed covering from 
neck till toe followed by bathing in infants involving face and skull ointment should be applied on the lesions only all family members should be treated cases not responding to permethrin ointment application can be given ivermectin 200 microgram per kg single doses or two doses two weeks apart coming to my second case a 6 year old male child was brought to opd by his parents with complaints of multiple nodular lesions over testicles since 6 months the child had multiple consultations but had no improvement in the conditions this is the case of nodular scabies it is the hypersensitivity reaction to the scabies mite treatment is eradication of the active infestation with scabicidal medication by permethrin and ivermectin lesions over testicles often require topical application of corticosteroids bd for 1 to 2 week some refractory cases may require intralesional steroids thank you dr kartikeyan uh, ah yes sir yes uh, actually uh, what makes uh, scabies in infants unique from scabies in older children sir can you please highlight for us Scabies in infants. How does it differ from scabies in infants? Scabies in infants uh, have a more of an inflammatory lesion. Scabies in infants have more inflammatory lesions. You can uh, multiple papules, not only in the typical sites. We tend to see only in the web spaces and this area, but they have more of a generalized eruption. They may have lesions on the face. Even scalp can get involved, particularly in uh younger children even neonates if develop scabies and infants they have extensive lesions and we should understand this is only a id eruption it is not you all these lesions will have scabies might scabies whatever lesions we see the papular lesions are only hypersensitivity reaction to the scabies might on average even in an infant you may find less than around 14 to 15 mites only you will be seen whatever we find all over the body the face they have the typical face face involvement the trunk the peri umbilical area the gluteal all these areas they get the lesions while in older children you get the typical site like in adults the web spaces the genitals the umbilicus the axilla and these areas and it never crosses in your older children adults above the neck but in infants and the neonates you find these lesions and many of them may become involve the palms and soles you get mild crusting you may get pustules you may get nodular lesions and the picture becomes bit more eczematized so what happens it gives a lot and secondary infection also sets in very easily so the picture is masked by all these factors so you have a secondary infection you have a rash which is more generalized you may have a fever so you have to be very careful in looking into the pointers the simple pointers which you have to look into this always is look into the palms and soles where they are involved and genitalia so if you have a lesions in the genitalia and palms and soles genitalia is very typical and it is particularly in male children in female children also you can see the vulval lesions you have itching and oozing and crusting you treat with antibiotics and then go for permethrin that is uh, the treatment protocol it responds very well as a doctor has pointed out the genital lesions nodular scabies is very persistent and doesn't respond very easily actually she told about uh, Uh, topical steroids and intralesional steroids we can use topical uh, tracrolimus or pimicrolimus also which are uh, new agents which are very effective immunomodulatory agents they also are very effective uh, which can avoid the intralesional injections and this is the major difference between uh, childhood and always i my dictum is very simple when you the child has scabies particularly younger children the mother definitely will have scabies so you screen the mother ask the mother for itching so if mother also has itching the diagnosis is very clear it is scabies so you have to treat the mother simultaneously and one more important condition which is commonly misdiagnosed is papular urticaria which we have that is a common differential diagnosis papular urticaria which presents as itchy eruption on the body very common in young children so the diagnostic problem starts whether it's papular urticaria or it's scabies how to treat in these cases that's why i told you the clue is papular urticaria palms and soles are not involved and genitalia is not involved papular urticaria typically occurs only in exposed sites sometimes in the trunk also and you may have lesions on the face also so there are more nodular lesions while here you find more papular lesions and papular urticaria uh, you give antihistamines 
and it uh, responds well to antihistaminics along with topical steroids and antibiotic. So in the case of scabies, obviously permethrin and uh, antihistaminics are enough. So this some point I think we have to uh, use to difference between these two conditions. Permethrin is safe to be applied on the scalp and face as well, sir? Uh, you can use it, uh, particularly more than two months of age, you can use it. But you should avoid the around the eyes and around the mouth, these areas. And use, uh, uh, you can, we have permethrin lotion is available, which one person lotion is available, rather than the cream. That can be used in younger children, a bit more safely. It's a lotion which usually used for uh, pediclosis that can be used and that gives good results. How do we differentiate nodular scabies from the classical scabies, sir? Why, why would you use the word nodular scabies specifically? Because there are popular nodular lesions uh, and nodular nodular scabies, no? Here, the nodular lesions are more resistant to treatment and typically occurs in axilla and genitalia. They are a bit nodular elevated and they are very intensely itchy. The child will always keep uh, scratching. Uh, what you get in scabies uh, in the trunk and others are more papules uh, and papillonodules, not the typical hard nodules which you get in the uh, scrotum as well as the axilla and these areas. And they are hard and resistant. They do not easily subside with normal permethrin. They are persistent lesions. And they develop a hypersensitive reaction, local hypersensitive reaction to the mite. Yes. No. Thank you. Thank you. So if I may add on. May I? May I yes, add on? Yes, ma'am. Your mask will be concluded. Actually, she said, you know, there were repeated consultations. So the pitfalls in the management of scabies would be one is initially diagnosis it, as uh, Kartikeyan sir mentioned. The next point is, you know, uh, whether they were all the family members were treated at the same time. Number three, with the, the typical uh, management of scabies should be, you have to tell them how it has to be applied. Counseling is very, very important. So the child should be given a bath with lukewarm water and then the application in the case of infant, of course, we said face and scalp cover. Otherwise, from the rest of the areas, uh, from the rest of the children, the retroauricular area from behind the ears, below the neck, entire body to be involved. And the cutting the nails is very important because, again, nails and the retroauricular areas are the reservoirs for the scabitic night. So after application, overnight application, and the next day morning, it has to be followed with a hot water bath. And then all the dresses, bed linen, everything has to be washed in hot water and dried in good sunlight. If it was a rainy season, then all these clothing and bedding and everything, whatever has to be put in a plastic cover and left aside for a period of four to four days to one week. And then that gets a mite killing. And this has to be repeated again after a period of one week. Permethrin has to be repeated again after a period of one, one week. And from two months onwards, we can start using permethrin cream. Less than two months, we usually talk about the 6% precipitated sulfur to be applied on three consecutive days. And then the bath has to be given after 24 hours after the third but only thing is this application is a little uh, cumbersome and malodorous. Now, these are paper patients. I mean, uh, consultants have started using one-person permethrin lotion for even uh, below two months of infants. And the next thing is, again, uh, mm -hmm. is going to be gamma benzene hexachloride lotion because normally we do not use, but in government setup, there are people who are using GPHC. That has to be repeated after two weeks after the prior application. And again, you know, if there's any child with neurological disorders, because this particular drug can have uh, neurotoxicity, we would not want to use GPHC. And in the case of ivermectin, ivermectin, it has to be not to be used in children below five years. And of course, we do give it at a dosage of 200 microgram per kilogram body weight or more than five years, it is six milligram and more than 12 years, it is 12 milligram. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Can I ask one question, Ashwath, Dr. Ashwath? Yes. This is for the moderator. Uh, uh, all this uh, dermo emergency and progressive lesion, when do you recommend biopsy, sir, in making a crucial diagnosis and which will help in the management? Dr. Kartikeyan, Dr. Malu, either of you could take the question. Sir is asking about the role for skin biopsy in a critical case situation. Mm -hmm. the biopsy might be the clincher. See, actually, biopsy. Uh, uh, Go on, sir. Madam, you can start. No problem. You finish. I, uh, you, yeah, I, you're see, started. I, yeah, biopsy okay. in the child, uh, normally we reserve it for those conditions where you will not have a clinical diagnosis. 
okay or you would want to establish a diagnosis like pemphigus vulgaris and you know you base it's going to be there for a, a longer duration of treatment and uh, probably a connective tissue disorder and apart from that morphy and now these are conditions where you really go in for a biopsy by and large if there is a clinic i mean clinical uh, definite diagnosis a granuloma annular you do not have to venture for a biopsy Uh, uh, I think I don't want to point the uh, bullous disorder which is sometimes a lethal one to make a, a lethal diagnostic features of bullous disorder epidermal lesions bullous or like that which is very very important the biopsy plays a vital role so there more biopsy Dr. we do immunofluorescence sir uh, what we what sir is talking about is uh just biopsy may not be very diagnostic uh, that is what we call histopathology we have to go for immunofluorescence because immunofluorescence and possibly antigen mapping because the bullous disorders uh, genetic mediated epidermolysis bullosa dystrophica or uh, simplex variants they you have to do an antigen mapping higher level antigen mapping and that is a biopsy for immunofluorescence uh, what is important in uh, dermatopathology the diagnostic feature is Uh, dermatopathology diagnosis most of the time is corroboratory with the clinical findings they may not be diagnostic like a surgical pathology where unless and unless it's malignancies most of the other inflammatory disorders or autoimmune disorders many of them are only corroboratory to the diagnosis which we make clinically so as sir was talking about it may be more useful to do uh, immunohisto immuno immunological uh, testing that is what we call yes Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Sir. Yeah, it is uh, already nine fifty. Yeah, yeah, we can. Yeah, please uh, stop sharing your slides, please. And uh, it's a really wonderful uh, session, and I think I really thankful to our uh, uh, judges, uh, Dr. Karthikeyan and uh, as well as Dr. Madhu. They are joint support dermatologists. and another thing is um, it's a uh, uh, all uh, uh, that uh, persons that were presented that the cases are really uh, uh, from short cases to even uh, long cases like uh, toxic epidermal uh, like tn and hjn uh, like a presentation also there even if you are going for uh, impetic also that uh, presented even scabies also definitely it's a uh, useful for our uh, a uh, pediatric uh, person so pediatric community and i uh, really i uh, thankful to uh, iap tnc who has given this uh, opportunity and i uh, really thankful to all the presenters who, are, who has done extremely very well for this uh, uh, sunday evening and it's a uh, fourth case presentation uh, from poporsi series and uh, really thankful to our um, uh, convener dr aswath uh, duraisami and uh, it's uh, so happy that uh, Uh, we are uh, almost uh, 200 uh, attendants in youtube also and uh, and once again i thank onandal and i uh, request dr aswath to tell please some few words and there really nothing for me to add i think we have had a wonderful piece today of the very mundane cases the empetigo and cbs is a commonly seen to the uh, exclusive and not so common cases like tn and uh, dermatomyositis we had a very good mixture of cases but what was more important was the immense practicality and the amount of wisdom and knowledge that both our moderators brought to this session we can't thank them enough for their patience and uh, putting up with us and as really queries for close to 2 hours thanks one and all our, uh, our gratitude for both the moderator and uh, i will also take the opportunity to thank all the presenters for sticking to the time schedule and also making lovely presentations with very illustrative case material we want you to pass on this word and make sure that more and more participation is there from the periphery because these patient case scenarios that are discussed here are extremely common and very uh, well discussed by a uh, eminent panelist so it is our desire that this should reach more and more people thank you one and all good night yeah thank you so much uh, thank you thank you iap tnc secretary dr atrumurugan to go out of thanks <clears throat> thank you sir um uh, i it's been a wonderful session that there's nothing else to say my special thanks to uh, our moderators uh, dr 
uh, Madhu Ma'am and Dr. Karthikeyan, my close friend, for uh, enlightening us about the various aspects uh, in all the cases. Um, I thank Dr. Ashwad for putting up with me and uh, most of us uh, for trying to get uh, mm -hmm. more simplified cases uh, rather than making it uh, complex, uh, which was what, which is what some of the uh, people felt actually when in the past series. Um, so special thanks to Dr. Ashwad. And I hope, as he said, we hope that more and more people from the periphery come with um, even common cases. See, I mean, see, one of the problems with this particular session is that everybody thinks we have to talk about rare things which nobody sees or uh, the rare cases which we need to diagnose. But the objective of this particular session uh, is definitely not that, and it is to more do more with uh, con learning better about common things. And uh, I'm very and I'm very sure that we achieved that aim today. So thank you very much, Dr. Ashwath and Dr. Rajendran. So hope to see you again next uh, month. And uh, good night. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.